Well, this is an interesting presentation because we cover a number of different subjects, all of which you'll get into in greater depth as we go through the year. So as you look at it here, um, what we really want to start touching on and taking a look at, of course, is the mind. Now, as we get into the mind, I don't think you're so interested in mine. You're more interested in your own mind and your paradigms. And the one thing that will change the paradigm um, more than anything is your own thinking. And oddly enough, that's what most people don't do. They've really got to begin to think. Now, as you look at this image, the of all the ideas I've learned over the past 50 years, this has to be the most important one. And, you know, I don't know if you've read it or I've said it before to you, but I had been studying for a good nine years, and I had an enormous amount of information because I was studying it every day. But it was like I had all the pieces for the puzzle, and they were laid out all over the table, and I couldn't get the pieces to fit. And what was missing was a picture. See, we don't have a picture of the mind, and when we go to work on changing the mind, we work in pictures. I want you to think if you were changing the setup of your uh, living room or your kitchen or whatever, another room where all the furniture is. You first of all get an image of where you wanted to put the furniture, and you would move it over there and then see, now, is this really what I want to do with it? And you would create in the physical the uh, an you know, a replica of the image that you're holding in your mind. Well, when it comes to changing the mind, we don't have a picture. We don't have a picture to work with. And that's what this little drawing does. The large circle, of course, is the mind, and the small circle is the body. You've got the conscious and the subconscious mind. Now, we've got to really gain an understanding of how these two parts function so differently. Now, I have always used my head as being my mind, and everything from the neck down as being the body. And then I would put an imaginary line right across the center of, uh, of my head. And on the top half is the conscious or the thinking mind. And that's really what we have to begin to do. We have to begin to think. And when we do that, our whole world can start to change, because we truly do become what we think about. Now, on a conscious level, that's where we have our educated mind, because this is where the intellect is resident. Now, this is the part of mind that school has really spent almost all its time on. It didn't give us the information about the mind. It gave us information where we were gathering information. And what we construed as an education wasn't really an education at all, for the most part. Um, you shouldn't let school get in the way of your education, because it's where you gather knowledge out of books and then repeat it. And it's all done in the conscious mind, but the conscious mind is not controlling your behavior. It's the emotional mind that controls the behavior, which is the subconscious. And the body is the instrument of the mind. And for the body to act on ideas, they have to be turned over to the subconscious. Now, the one point all great leaders have agreed on is that we become what we think about. This is the part where we choose. I was talking to a lady today, and we were talking about the importance of choosing, because you do choose. You know, Viktor Frankl pointed out that it really didn't matter how much physical or, or mental abuse you were subjected to. You have the ability to choose your own thoughts. No one else can take control over your mind without your permission. And, you know, we have the ability to choose any image we want, and the images we choose are the ones that are going to control us. I was um, telling Rebecca today, uh, are you on the phone, Rebecca? Yep, I'm here. Did you download that song? I have the lyrics up right in front of me. I haven't had a chance to listen to it, but I've been reading the lyrics over and over again. Well, the lyrics are phenomenal. I was on the plane yesterday. I was flying from Los Angeles to Toronto. And I might have watched one movie in a year on the plane. And they're right there in front of you on the back of the seat that sits in front of you. But every now and then, I'll put the earphones in, and I'll go on to the online radio, and I'll put some quiet jazz mu music on in the background while I'm thinking. And so I thought, I'm going to do that. So I put a little bit of jazz movie on. 
very quiet, and I was listening to it. And then I saw albums, so I hit it, and some albums come up on the screen. So I took a Frank Sinatra album, and I listened to them go through a number of songs. And then I saw Nat King Cole. Now, Nat King Cole was one of my favorite singers. The guy had a phenomenal voice. And so I put it on, and a song, Pretend, come up. And the lyrics are so perfect. Let me just share them with you. Because pretend you're happy when you're blue. It isn't very hard to do. And you'll find happiness without an end whenever you pretend. He said, remember, anyone can dream, and nothing's bad as it may seem. The little things you haven't got could be a lot if you pretend. He said, you'll find a love you can share, and you can call all your own. Just close your eyes and sure he will be there. You'll never be alone. Now, if you sing this melody, you'll be pretending just like me. The world is mine. It can be yours, my friend. So why don't you pretend? And I'm thinking, God, you want to download that song. I listened to it a couple of times. The lyrics are so perfect, and it's exactly the way it is. Just pretend. And the beautiful part is we've got the ability to do that. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, we've got the right to do it, and we're the only form of life, apparently, that can. We have the ability to choose. Then we have the ability to accept or reject anything that comes down the road. So when we start to hear bad news, we don't have to get caught up in it. You get caught up in bad news and turn it over to your emotional mind, you're going to ruin your day. When bad news comes along, you do not have to you say, well, you have to pay attention. No, you really don't. You can reject it. You've got the ability to choose your own images, whatever you want to put in your mind. You have the ability to originate information in your conscious mind. Now, all that's going on up top. Nothing can affect your life until you let it into your emotional mind. Now, your emotional mind must accept whatever you give to it. It doesn't have a choice. There's no choosing there. It must accept whatever you give. It cannot reject, and we've got to get this straight. It, you cannot differentiate between that which is real and that which is imagined. It's, um, you know, it's, it's really quite important that we understand this. And, you know, when you stop and think of all the lessons we teach little children, we could just as easily teach this to them. We could turn it into a little game where they would learn it. And they'd learn they don't have to accept that information. They've got the ability to choose whatever they want. But we don't do that. It's not taught in school. You see, the truth is we must begin to think. And most of us are programmed not to think. Let's take a look how it happens. On the one side, you see yourself today. On the other side, when you were an infant. Now let's look at it today the way we operate. There's information flooding at you into your consciousness. It comes at you from all sides. You have sensory factors. They're like little antennae that are sticking out of your conscious mind. You see, hear, smell, taste. And so information is forever coming in there. Now you have a reasoning factor. That's what gives you the ability to think. It's your reasoning factor that gives you the ability to think and gives you the ability to say, I don't like that information, and just reject it. But we don't do that. Why don't we do it? Well, the truth is, we don't do it because we're not thinking. We leave that conscious mind just set aside, and everything flows into the subconscious mind. Why do you think the most intelligent creature on the planet stays stuck for, their, for virtually their whole life? Year after year, they come up with the same dull, frustrating results. Well, let's take a look at why they do that. We'll just set this aside for the time being. Look over here on the other side now. When you were an infant, what was going on? You didn't have the ability in your conscious mind to reject anything because your conscious mind hadn't developed. Your higher faculties were not developed. And so whatever was going on around you went right into your subconscious mind, and the subconscious had no ability to reject it. You see, the image that you hold of you, your self-image, 
was programmed when you were just an infant. The truth is, part of it is genetic. It's passed on from one generation to the next. And those ideas keep flooding in there. The child has no ability to reject it. That's why the, a little child learns the language they learn. And if there's multilinguistic people in the house, they'll learn multiple languages. If it's bilingual, they'll learn a couple of languages. But you go to places in Asia and they uh, speak four and five languages and think nothing of it. You know, well, what kind of an image do we form of ourselves? If you're growing up in a, uh, in a welfare area, you're not going to grow up with an image of prosperity. That's why almost all welfare, re welfare recipients are third, fourth, and fifth generation welfare recipients. Well, you see, your self-image is just one idea. That's how you think of you, what you think of you. And if you've got a feeling of inferiority, you probably didn't originate it yourself. You probably inherited it. But that is just one image. When you bring all the images together, that's referred to as a paradigm. And the paradigm literally controls our life. Now, if you look at it, that's why people go through life the way they do. They don't think. If, if you don't believe me, just listen to the conversations of most people. They'd never say what they're saying. They'd never do what they're doing if they were thinking. You stand back and watch them, and you think, this doesn't make, why would people do that? Well, they're doing it because they're in the habit of doing it. They don't give it any thought. They're in the habit of doing it because they were programmed to do it when they were little kids. I remember when I was growing up, you have to be 15, 16. They're asked, are you going to go to school? No, no, I don't like it. I'm out of here. Well, I get a job. Get going. And that was just the way it is. That was the accepted truth. When my kids started to grow up, I didn't ask them if they were going to go. I asked them where they were going to go. And they all went to school. Now, let's take a look at this from another point of view. Cybernetics and paradigms are both control systems and operate essentially on the same principle. Both maintain a definite course of action and will not deviate from that course that has been established. You must alter the paradigm to achieve the results that you desire. Now, Cybernetics is an interesting concept. The word cybernetics was coined during the Second World War. Uh, Weiner and Rosenbluth, uh, a, phys a physicist and a mathematician, come up with it. They didn't even have a name for it. But it's the science of controlled communication in the animal and in some machines. Let's take a look at how, how it works. There's a thermostat that you may find in your house or in a room in a hotel. And you go and you set the thermostat, let's say, at 70 degrees. Now, if you're living here in Toronto in the wintertime, that's about where you would have it. But you might be sitting in a chair and reading a book, and all of a sudden you feel a draft around your feet. You get up and you go and take a look at the thermometer, and you see the temperature has dropped to 65 degrees. Now, there used to be a time when you'd have to go and check your furnace and find out what was going on. Not anymore. The thermostat picks up the deviation from the set goal. What's the set goal? Well, if it's 70, and you go and take a look at it, and it's 65, that's a deviation from the set goal. But the thermostat sends a message to the furnace. The fire's turned on, the fan's turned on, until the room temperature is brought back up to 70 degrees. And as the temperature keeps going up, keeps going up, the flame stays on. And the flame stays on until the room temperature reaches 70 degrees, and the flame automatically turns off. That's climate control in the house. This all happens automatically. Here's another example. Here's an airplane. We'll say the airplane is uh, on a flight from, I don't know, uh, New York to Paris or somewhere. Well. A flight pattern has been programmed into the plane's computer system. When the plane goes off course, the cybernetic mechanism, or the system, measures the deviation from the set goal and then corrects the flight pattern. And here's how it's working. From Chicago to Paris, it hits with some turbulence. The plane's flying along, it's right on course. But boom, something happens. 
and the plane starts to go off course. The cybernetic mechanism picks up the deviation from the set goal, brings the plane right back on course. Pilot didn't have to do a thing. The automatic pilot, the cybernetic system in the plane controls that. Now let's take a look at how this works with the person. There's your subconscious mind, and you have a self-image. And the results are controlled by your self-image. They always have been. If you want to change your results, you're going to have to change what's going on in the mind. So let's suppose a person's overweight. They go on a diet, and they start to lose weight. Okay? The cybernetic mechanism picks up the deviation from the set goal. It sends a signal through the nervous system. The behavior patterns will change, and the person will put the weight back on that they lost. Now think of people that go on diets. They're on diets, off diets, on diets, off. They have an image in their subconscious mind of how they see their body. And they see themselves overweight. And they honestly believe if they change what their intake into their body, the food, that that's going to do the job. Why do you think people gain and lose tons in their lifetime? Now, this paradigm is so strong that if you try to tell them that the weight of their body is being controlled by an image in their mind, they're not going to believe you. They will not believe it. They don't believe that. They'll just say, well, it's the metabolism. It's this. It's that. It's the other thing. It's the image the person holds in their subconscious mind. If they had an image of themselves at their perfect weight, and their perfect weight isn't pounds or stones or kilos or whatever way they weigh it, your perfect weight is an image. It's a picture in your mind of how you see your body. Okay? You want to read Psycho-Cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell and Maltz. It's a phenomenal book. Here's another one. Self-image. This is a child's self-image. And let's say the child is getting poor grades in school. Why? It's because of the image in their subconscious mind. You say, well, no, I mean, not everybody can get good grades. Yes, they can. There's perfection in every one of us. The child comes home with a poor grade, so they're grounded, and they're made to study. Okay? And what happens? They go to school, they get a test, and their marks start to go up. And their marks go up, and they may go from a C and D to a B plus or something. The cybernetic mechanism picks up the deviation from the set goal. This kid has a poor image. They're not supposed to get good marks. It picks up the deviation from the set goal, sends a signal into the nervous system, the behavioral patterns are changed until they're back on course with the C and D average. If you have a child in school and the child's getting poor grades, I can guarantee you the problem's in the self-image. It's in the image they're holding of themselves in their subconscious mind. If you have a situation where a person feels they're overweight, it has to do with the image in their subconscious mind. They can go on a diet, but I guarantee you, when they lose the weight, they'll put it back on again. It'll happen every time until they change the image in their subconscious mind. Now, most people don't believe that, and so they don't do it. And so in their lifetime, they gain and lose tons. Now, let's take a look here. There's a power flowing into your consciousness. You'll see the symbol on the left is negative, on the right is positive. Now, as this power flows into our consciousness, let's understand we have a paradigm. And when we think of anything, the image that we build is going to be due to the image that we have in our subconscious mind. If a person is earning, let's say, $50,000 a year, then that's their paradigm. That's what they're programmed to earn. Do you know what they think? They think the thoughts of a person that's earning $50,000 a year. Do you think they're going to think the thoughts of a person that earns $150,000? No. Even if they sat down with their intellect and said, well, if I did this and that and thus and so, then it would happen. No, it won't. Not until the paradigm changes. Now, you can choose anything you want, but understand the thoughts that you think are going to be largely due to the paradigm that you hold in your subconscious mind. And you keep impressing those ideas, and that's the way your life will be. Whatever you're emotionally involved in is going to dictate which way you go. If you're letting the outside world control you, it's just going to keep repeating itself. Now let's look at it this way for a moment. 
you have a choice. You can remain in ignorance, or you can eliminate the ignorance with knowledge. There's only one problem in the entire world, and that problem's ignorance. Ignorance causes people to judge people. It causes people to look up or down at people. If you feel inferior with one person, you're going to feel superior with the other. That's your law of polarity. You see the law of polarity there on the screen, the ignorance and the knowledge, the negative and the positive. Now let's suppose a person's plugged into this side. They want to get something. They haven't got the results. And what do they start to do? They start to worry. Then what happens? They impress that idea. The worry turns to fear. Now that power came in. It had no form. You can give it any form you want. And they decided to worry. And they impressed the worrisome idea. It turned to fear. Now that energy has to be expressed. Whatever's impressed has to be expressed on through the physical body. It sets up a vibration we're commonly known as anxiety. Now the anxiety is not expressed. Anxiety is suppressed. And the suppression then turns to depression. Now you see a pattern being set up here. That person is going to get sick. It goes from anxiety, suppression, depression, to disease, to disintegration. That's why St. Clair Lewis said, we don't die, we kill ourselves. Why would a person go down this track? Because they're in the habit of going down this track. They worry about almost everything. They doubt their own ability. Why do they do that? They got low self-esteem. They don't really understand who they are. You build an image in your mind, a beautiful image, and you're not going to feel bad. However, you might doubt yourself. And that's going to lead you then into more negative thoughts. Now let's take another look. You say faith based on understanding is the key to freedom. So let's go over here. What do we want to understand? We may not have any money, but we want to understand if we get into a prosperous vibration, we will attract the money. So here now, you're choosing. You choose because you understand. Now there's only one way to develop understanding, and that's through study. There is no other way to do it. Now you study this for an entire year. Your awareness is going to skyrocket. Now where doubt and worry, understanding's polar opposites, turns into something called fear, understanding turns into something we call faith. Now where fear manifests as anxiety, faith manifests as well-being. Now where the anxiety is suppressed, the well-being is expressed. You never said to anybody, hi, how are you today? And they sort of bury their head and cover their mouth and say, I'm really excited. They don't do that. You see it in the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they meet and greet people. The expression then accelerates. Why? Because they're at ease. They're as loose as ashes. Energy flows freely through them, and they're in a creative vibration. So that's where creation comes from in your consciousness. Now, it's a beautiful concept, but it's one that most people don't understand. Now, when we do understand this, we can step out and make some enormous moves and bet on herself. Now, I'm going to show you another tremendous concept that we get into. And we've got a choice. We can go down that road or we can go down that road. Now, personally, when you know that's there and you find yourself anxious or you know, sort of depressed, understand why you are. The cause of that is up at the top there. It's ignorance. Eliminate it. Get over here. Start to study really pack the good information in. Mix with the right people. Okay? Now, there's a terror barrier. I'm going to show you how this works. This is what we call bondage, reason, conflict, and freedom. Okay? These are the four stages that we go through, and we've got to go through a terror barrier. So let's take a look. Here's a person with X-type conditioning producing X-type results. Now, if they have X-type conditionings, conditions, and the body's an instrument of the mind, they're going to be in an X-type vibration. What do we mean by X? X is the unknown factor. So we could call your conditioning X, and we can call mine X. So my conditioning may be quite different than yours. I've studied for 50 years. Odds are pretty good it would be. Um, you have the ability, though, with this conditioning to change it. You can change it into anything you want. Okay? Do we? Not very often. If you have X-type paradigm, X-type conditioning, 
Now, if you want to know what your paradigm is like, look at your results. What do you settle for? Do you let people push you around, boss you around? Are you afraid to express your own opinions because of what she might think or he might think or what they might say? Have you any idea how many people are controlled by what they think another person is thinking? That's conditioning. We're conditioned to do that. I think most of us have been raised the wrong way. You can't blame the parents. They did the best they knew how. But they couldn't give you what they didn't have. All right? Okay. Now let's take a look at this. Okay? There's a power flowing in, and this is called the comfort zone. It's also called bondage. Now, you may not like the results that you're getting, but you're comfortable with them. You take there's women being abused, and they're more afraid of leaving than they are staying. You say, well, they're not comfortable. No, they are comfortable in the bad environment. Everything's wrong with them. If they weren't comfortable, they would leave. You say, well, they don't like it. Oh, they may not like it. People get results they don't like but they're comfortable with them. They're used to them. They've been living with it for so long. Now look here. There's the person in bondage. X-type conditioning, X-type vibration, X-type thoughts, X-type results. Now, this is a process here. This is what we call the point of reason. This is where a person gets a why idea in their conscious mind. They get an idea that they're going to build a business. They're going to step out. They're really going to make the thing different. They're going to earn as much every month as they previously earned all year. How are they going to do that? Well, they've first got to get that idea into the subconscious and act on it. You see, as long as the idea is in the conscious mind, nothing happens. And that's where most ideas die. They're stillborn. They never break into the bright, clear light of day. Why? The paradigm is so strong, it stops us from doing it. Now, when you're thinking of doing this, this new idea, this big step forward, that paradigm's inside talking to you. It's like a little chatterbox. It never stops. And it never encourages you, always discourages you. If you're going to step out and move ahead, the paradigm's going to try and stop you. Not going to work. You tried it before. You know it won't work. Why are you doing this? You're going to lose the money. Now, here's the other crazy part. Most of the people surrounding us are in harmony with the paradigm. So, you see, if you've got a new idea and you want to make that idea fly, I would not talk to anyone that does not support the idea. And when you find people that support it, just talk to them until you're really strong with the idea. Now, as long as the idea is just in the conscious mind, nothing happens. That's a point of reason. So what do we have to do? Well, let's stay in tune here. Now, this is what we call the terror barrier. This is where we take the idea and we impress it upon the subconscious. When we do that, we move into an XY vibration. That is a conflict. It's a mental conflict. And all kinds of crazy things happen. We hit the terror barrier. And instantly and automatically, doubt, worry, fear, anxiety strike. And what do we do? Boom. Right back into bondage. I may not have much, but at least I know what I've got. I'm not going to get hurt here. I'm safe here. Now back it up a minute. Here's a person. They've taken the Y idea, and they said, I'm going to do this. The second they step out and act on it, all hell breaks loose. A barrier, a barrier comes up. You hit that barrier, and bingo. You start to doubt yourself, and you start to worry. Why? The vibration is caused by what's going on in the subconscious. Vibration on a conscious level is called feeling. And when you get an XY idea going on in your subconscious mind, that's a mental conflict. It goes from doubt and worry to fear and then to anxiety. Now get this. I'm saying this slow relative to the way it happens. You're dealing with the central nervous system, which is the most phenomenal electrical system known to man. So when you hit that terror barrier, it's boom, right back here. And you will justify why you should go back here, why you shouldn't do that. It's silly. It won't work now. You know, you haven't got enough money. What if you lose? You know what I always tell a person when they're starting to hit the terror barrier? I said, listen, 
you're going to invest a certain amount of money, you're going to invest a certain amount of time. Now, if you're going to let fear control you, you're not going to do it. Let's suppose you do it, and the worst thing happens, you lose the money and you lose the time. You're going to spend the money and the time anyway. You're not taking it with you. Let's suppose the best thing happens. You compound your, your return. You can never let the, the terror barrier stop you. You just cannot do it. How do we get around that? Well, let's take a look at this. Faith based on understanding is the key to freedom. We've got to make sure we're going to go right through that terror barrier because on the other side of it is what you're looking for and what I'm looking for. It's what we're all homesick for, freedom. And so you bust through there. Now, does that eliminate the conflict? Uh-uh. It does not eliminate the conflict. You've gone through the terror barrier. You still have all the doubts and fears. But through the repetition of thinking and acting on the idea, pretty soon the old conditioning changes. And you're living in a totally different world. Now, here's the bottom line. What happens then? The Y becomes the X. And you've got to start all over again. But you see, the more often you do it, when I step out and go for a goal, um, if it doesn't scare me, if I don't hit a terror barrier, I know the goal's not worth much. You've got to make up your mind that you're going to do something, you're going to make it happen. You cannot live on this side of life. You've got to get over on this side of life. This is really where it's at. Now, you study these slides, and then you study this terror barrier and realize on the other side of the terror barrier is something phenomenal, absolutely incredible. You know, I could get Rebecca or Sandy or myself, and we could share personal stories with you uh, until we're old and gray. Well, I'm already old and gray. <laughs> um, I'm thinking of Sandy Gallagher, our CEO, when she closed her law practice after 20 years. She was afraid to send the letter. She didn't want to do it anymore. She wanted to be in this business. She was running this company. I said, just hit the send button and send it. She hit a send button, and she sent a letter to all of her clients. She had closed her practice. When she hit the send bucket, she let a scream out of her because she couldn't take it back. It was scary. Now, she had all kinds of reasons why she couldn't close that law practice. And so for four or five months, she was trying to run this company and run the law practice, too. Saying, what was stopping her? It was the terror barrier that was stopping her. And she should come up with all kinds of stories. And I used to listen to them and think, too. That's pretty interesting. That's one I hadn't heard before. It was the terror barrier. Now, look at Freedom is what it's all about. If I want to be free, i got to be me. Not to me I think you think it should be. Not to me I think my wife thinks it should be. Not to me I think my kids think it should be. If I want to be free, I've got to be me. Now, purpose, vision, and goals. is like James Allen said, until thought is linked with purpose, there isn't any intelligent accomplishment. 